this passage, Jesus has given us a, a daunting command. The daunting command is he says, you are to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And as I was thinking about this passage and praying about this passage and what to say today, I kept thinking of a particular question. I kept thinking, what is it that motivates us to do things? And what is it that motivates us to do something difficult and to do something great? Now, psychology has taught us that the best motivators are things like positive feedback, encouragement, training, encouraging people to use things that they're already good at and, and to build upon those. We know that people are motivated when other people walk alongside them and help them to do their best. We know that that's how people often do great things. But you do realize that's not actually how people motivate others most of the time, right? We realize that's not kind of the normal human mode of operation. Instead, we use some different techniques. We like to use two in particular, guilt and fear. All the time, people are motivated by guilt and fear, but, but here's the thing about guilt and fear. They're terrible motivators. Oh, they might get you to do something in the short term, but they don't really get you to change your behavior in the long term because eventually you kind of get over it. You no longer feel guilty and you no longer feel afraid. Or sometimes you, you take it in so deeply that you just kind of quit because you always feel guilty, you always feel afraid, so you, so you stop. But we use it all the time and we use it everywhere. It's, it's the way the world uses it. Like, like think about this. Have you ever gone to like a coffee shop and you get a coffee for two bucks and they have this tip jar there and there's like, like fives in it? And you're thinking, who tips five bucks on a two dollar cup of coffee? Someone apparently, actually I think they probably put it in there to encourage you to give. And then this week, I, I went out, I took my daughter out for breakfast. We went out for breakfast. We went to a place where you go up to the counter and you order, and then you go and you sit down and you have this little buzzer, and then they buzz you up and you get it, and then you bust your own dishes and everything, and on the receipt, it has a spot for tip. So I get this. I think, I'm doing all the work here. So for tip, I just drew a line through it, and I give it back, and she says, oh, you're not going to do a tip. Well, I already put a zero there, so no. <laughs> you know, I guess, but you, you feel kind of embarrassed. You feel like, oh my gosh, I'm guilty. Like maybe, maybe I should have tipped. Maybe I'm cheap. I don't know. But, but may, maybe I should have tipped them. But it's all about guilt. You know, sometimes we do this even in church and other places too. Like, you know, think of like, think of like a volunteer organization. Think of like, I don't know, like, like the PTA. Have you ever been to one of these meetings? Where someone gets up and says, well, this year we're doing a bake sale, and we're doing this, and we're doing that, and we're raising a bunch of money for, for all the kids and for the teachers and all this stuff, and it's really important. And we need more people to be involved because it's just a few of us. And if you don't do it, we're not going to be able to do this stuff anymore, and our kids and the teachers are all going to suffer. You ever heard this kind of thing? We do this in church all the time, too. We say, you know, if we don't get volunteers, we're just not going to be able to do it. So we're always motivating people through, through guilt. Oh, and sometimes you'll get somebody to step up and to do something, but it's not really living into the best of what we're called to do. It's not living into our calling. It's just doing it because we feel bad. But there's actually something that, that's even worse than guilt and fear, and I'm afraid in the church we do it even more than the other two, and here's what it is. It's, it's shame. Now, shame is different than guilt. Guilt is this sense that you've done something wrong. You've broken the rules. You've broken God's rules. You can confess. You can be forgiven. And you can move on. Shame, though, is different. Shame is not, I've done something wrong. Shame is this deep, unshakable feeling that there's something wrong with me. It's not just that I did something wrong. It's that, that I'm the problem. I'm afraid many times in church we, we use this as a technique to try to motivate people. Or, or even subconsciously we tell people that they should be ashamed, that there's something wrong with you. Because you don't live up to everything that God wants you to do, which is true. 
But I want you to know that, that when shame is used, when shame is used in the church, you're not getting this from Scripture and you're not getting it from Jesus. We're getting it because it's, it's kind of like the, the cultural way that we talk about things and we try to get people to do things because we want them to be different people. And we're always telling people in church, you need to do more and be more. But that's not what Jesus says. Actually, the two passages that we read this morning both deal with our motivations for doing things, but they don't come from the perspective of guilt or fear or shame, but instead they come from a different perspective. Think of the psalm that we read, Psalm 127. You know, we always get hung up on the end of that psalm with this quiver full of sons. Now, it's not really ultimately about that, and I can tell you I have three sons. They're great. It's a mixed bag sometimes, but they're great. But it's really not just about that. Actually, this is a psalm, it's it's from a section of the psalms that scholars call psalms of ascent. Psalms of ascent are psalms that were songs that people would sing as they traveled to Jerusalem for the great festivals. And they would be going on their way to Jerusalem up to the temple to worship. Now, if you've ever been to Israel, one of the things that you learn is that Jerusalem is uphill from pretty much everywhere. And you go uphill to get to Jerusalem. That's why they call them Songs of Ascent, because they built it on this high place. And there's the temple up there. And people would come from all corners of Israel and even beyond to go to the temple to worship on the holy days. And people would make these long, difficult, arduous journeys, often traveling through the dry desert and the heat of the day. And they would be going along trying to make it to Jerusalem. And you can imagine as people are traveling on their way, they become weary and wonder if it's worth it. So these psalms of ascent are psalms that were sung as people traveled up to Jerusalem, but they're also songs that people sing throughout life at times when we feel weary, weary, when we feel worried, when we feel as though we're wondering if everything is worth it. Psalm 127 is one of these songs. And in this song, it kind of raises up two important things. It raises up our work, And it raises up our families. And there's something in common with both of them. That without God at the center of it, it can seem like they don't have a purpose or a point. Think about the beginning when he says, unless the Lord builds the house, the laborer works in vain. The psalmist is not saying that building a house or labor is worthless. He's not saying it's not worth our time or not worth our energy. That is not his point. What he's saying is he says, when we do it, we should do it to the glo- for the glory of God. Because when God is at work in the midst of it, even something that seems rather ordinary and rather mundane becomes filled with meaning and with purpose because we're doing it for the glory of God. Martin Luther actually spoke about this when he spoke about Christian vocation. And he sort of rejected this idea that there are Christian vocations and there are secular vocations. And Christian vocations are somehow better than secular vocations. Instead, what he said, he said, everything that we do is to be done for the glory of God and to honor God. He says, even the shoemaker, if the shoemaker works for the glory of God, then what he'll do is he will make shoes to the best of his ability, and he'll probably make the best shoes in the world because he's making them for the glory of God. But without the blessing of God, so much of work seems like mundane drudgery and ordinary, and we probably all, at one point or another at our jobs, have wondered, what's the point? But if we think about this psalm, and we think about doing our work for the glory of God. Think about how that could, that could make a difference. You know, if you work with people, it would mean that we would treat people with honor and with respect, with patience and with kindness, even if they haven't earned it. If you work with numbers, it means that you'll deal with numbers w- with great care and that you'll deal with not just numbers with great care, but you'll be precise and you'll, you'll do your best to be right because you're doing it to the glory of God, not just so the numbers work out. Or if you're dealing in your job with, with a position where you're dealing with people's private and personal information, you'll treat it with incredible respect. You'll treat those people with, with tenderness and with care. 
Because it's not just about their information, it's about giving glory to God through what you do. Because we believe that everything that we do, done to give glory to God, can be used by him. And then in the second part of the psalm, it talks about family. And it talks about the blessing of family. And what it says is it says that when God gifts us with a family, it's a blessing. But if we don't think about our family in the context of being God's gift, it can be something that we either take for granted or something that we even resent. But this psalm tells us that everything that we have and everything that we use, if we use it and have it and take it, intending to use it for the glory of God, even the ordinary things of life can be redeemed. It's a way of thinking about our place in the world and living life. In John chapter 15, we kind of jumped into the middle of a, of a long discourse that Jesus is having with his disciples. It's after he's been betrayed by Judas, and he's sitting there with his disciples at the last summer as he's preparing to make his final journey to the cross. And Jesus is giving his disciples instructions. And one of the things he tells them at the beginning is he says, there is no greater love than for someone to lay down his life for his friends. Now we know that Jesus is about to do this because he's about to give his life on the cross for our salvation and for his disciples and all who follow him. So we know that Jesus is about to live this out and give this example. But then as he's saying this, he says, you know, that not only are, are you my, my servants, but now you're also considered my friends. And my friends do as I command. And then he gives this great and daunting command. He says, and I command you, therefore, to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Now, this image of fruit bearing is one that is not just in the New Testament. It's all throughout Scripture. In the Old Testament, in the prophets, through the New Testament, Jesus uses it in his parables. The Apostle Paul uses it in his letters. And Jesus uses it here to teach his disciples. But here's the thing about Jesus talking about this vineyard or this orchard, this fruit bearing. Here's the thing about it. Whenever we hear it in church, and I have to confess, I think I've been guilty of this. But when we talk about this orchard, this vineyard, this call to bear fruit, we always seem to focus on the passages where Jesus is talking about pruning back branches that aren't fruitful and cutting down plants that are worthless. We love to focus on unfruitfulness. And here's what happens. Whenever I hear someone highlight or talk about or preach on these passages that talk about the unfruitful plant that gets thrown into the fire, you know, where they're good for nothing but the chainsaw and the drying pile and eventually the flame. Whenever I hear that, here's what I think of. Me. I think, man, what kind of fruit that lasts do I produce? Maybe, may, maybe I'm one of the branches that's going to get lopped off and thrown into the fire. Maybe I'm one of those useless bushes that's just going to be cut down and thrown away. Maybe, maybe God's angry at me. Maybe what, what I've done in my life isn't, isn't worth anything. and It doesn't last at all. I think I'm probably not alone in, in thinking that. We're told it all the time, right? You better be fruitful or you're going to get lopped off and burned up because you're worthless. I want you to know, though, that you might have heard that from people, you might have heard it from preachers, but you did not hear it from Jesus. And you did not read that in Scripture. That's how people often approach it, because we think of gear, guilt and fear and shame. Think about the passage that we read from John 15, and what is it that Jesus said? He said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Therefore, go and bear fruit, fruit that lasts do you see where that starts? It starts in Jesus choosing you, not you choosing Jesus. 
It starts in his work on our behalf, not on our work on his behalf. It begins because God loves us. In Jesus Christ, he's given his son for us and for our salvation. When Jesus says, go and bear fruit and fruit that lasts, he's rooting it in our relationship with him that gives everything that we do purpose and meaning. And here's the other thing. You know, when you hear people say, well, if you're not producing fruit, you're going to be cut off, there's always some looming idea about what the fruit is that you need to be bearing, but they never tell you exactly what it is, usually. And here's why. Because Jesus doesn't say. Jesus doesn't say, oh, the fruit is this and that. Jesus just says, go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Now, we do know one piece of it. One piece of it is that Jesus says that that fruit that lasts is, is living a life where we love our neighbors and the people around us. In John's gospel, there's really only two great commands that are given in the whole gospel. The first one is that we would follow and believe in Jesus. And the second is that we would love others as we love ourselves. These are the two commands that Jesus gives in the gospel of John. And then he tells us to bear fruit that will last. Well, what does that look like? It's a beautiful image because fruit has multiple uses. You know, one of the things fruit does is it creates beauty. If you have a fruit tree in your yard, or if you ever go to an orchard in the spring, what do you see? You see beautiful flowers that beautify the landscape. Maybe one of the things that God asks us to do if he calls us to be fruitful is simply to add beauty to the world around us. You know, loving our neighbors and serving them and loving our neighbors as ourselves is one of the ways that we bring beauty into the world. Because when we show our love for other people, it's a beautiful and wonderful thing. Another thing that fruit does is it it, it gives strength and it gives sustenance to others. You know, fruit on the tree is not produced simply for its own sake, it's produced for the sake of the world and those who use it. Fruit trees provide food for animals and for people. Fruit trees provide sustenance for those who need it and strength for those who need it. Fruit produces something that's good for the sake of the world. Perhaps what Jesus is saying is he's saying, if you're going to be a fruitful person in creating fruit that lasts, then what you need to do is you need to do things so that there's something good that happens in the world. For the sake of this broken world that I love, that you would produce something that's useful and helpful and strengthening. Maybe part of being fruitful is being a person who thinks about encouraging and strengthening other people, the people around us. I think that's part of what Jesus means by by producing fruit that will last. There's another thing that fruit does too. You know, fruit almost always has seeds in it, unless it's some genetically modified thing. But what do the seeds do? They, they produce other trees and other vines that produce more fruit in other places. You know, if you're like me, every once in a while I'll be like eating an apple in the car. You ever do this? And you know, you'll have this core and, and again, if you're like me, if I put it in the, like in the cup holder, it's going to sit there for like three months. And then I'm going to get in the car like, man, it smells bad in here. And I'll reach in and I'm like, oh, what, what is that? Oh, that apple. So I hope there's no police officers here. But what I do is I kind of wait until I get to a spot that's got like a little wooded section next to me. And I throw it out the window. It's biodegraded. Well, it'll be gone in a week, right? That's what I tell myself. But it's going to be gone. But, but the thing is, like, it's also possible that those seeds will burrow into the ground and they'll take root and something will start to grow. And that one day there will be another beautiful and fruitful tree that grows and produces something that's beautiful, produces something that gives sustenance and strength to those who need it, that feeds animals and people who are coming by. Fruit is something that, that reproduces itself out in the world and it creates more beauty and more sustenance and more strength. I think part of the fruit that Jesus calls us to produce, fruit that will last, is fruit that reproduces itself. That by the things that we do and by the way that we live, 
we'll find that the good news of the gospel is spread in places we would never expect to people we wouldn't have happened to think that it would make an impact, but it does because it's God that's at work and not simply us. Jesus has given us this great and difficult command to produce fruit and fruit that will last. But Jesus' command to you is not work harder, work smarter, and do more. Jesus' command is give your life to me and trust that I will work through you and in you. Do everything for my glory. And if you do it for my glory, you will produce fruit that lasts. Because if you do things for Christ's glory, you will love your neighbors in ways you wouldn't on your own. You'll serve your neighbors in need because you know that God loves them. You will be kind to those who don't necessarily deserve it because you know that Jesus has been kind to you when you certainly didn't deserve it. You'll love your neighbors as yourself because you want to live in a way that pleases and honors Jesus' command to you. How do we produce fruit that lasts? It's not so much a command as it is an invitation. An invitation to give our lives again to Jesus, trusting that he will produce in us what he wants us to produce. And when it's fruit that he has created, it will last forever because it is his good and gracious gift. Let us pray.